Hi everyone, welcome back to another video in our series, Critical Thoughts, where we're bringing you lots of different perspectives on the way that lived experience works in suicide prevention. Today's chat was with Jay, who wants you to start to change the way that you think about gender and sexual diversities uh, and binaries in the lived experience space and how the way that we categorize men and women might be disadvantaging and forgetting a whole range of people in the work that we do. So I'll leave it up to Jay to talk you through what these diversities are and I hope you enjoy. Thanks so much Jay for sitting down with me and chatting today. Really interested to hear your thoughts around um, you know how we emphasize the differences between men and women in uh, in data and how you know the different groups um, have different rates of suicide attempts and, and um, deaths by suicide. Mm. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts around kind of that binary and some of the complexities with that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when looking at groups and like looking at microcosms and stuff is really useful. And um, I guess this is really not an admonishment of that trying to be more of an expansion and like a kind of opening is kind of my idea we're talking about this um because if if we're just looking at there's kind of two ways to go like there's the complexity within grouping people by sex so characteristics of male and female in that they're biologically driven and um any kind of uh ideas we assign to those two sex characteristics are often social <laughs> constructed uh they're fabrications um which don't mean that they don't play out and exist in um, real life. Of course they do. Um, but these kind of ideas and notions that we apply to fem femininity, masculinity, male, female, are just constructs. And so they don't really paint a full picture of the narrative. So particularly if we're looking at being like a, a kind of person-centered, you know, kind of hitting that, uh, beating that drum of individual, um, you know, self-determination, um, uh, person-centered approaches but we're still kind of grouping people into these categories I feel like sometimes they're at odds with each other especially when it's kind of impossible I make up it's impossible to um, separate our ideas about male and female from each other uh, but the other side of that is the LGBTQIA plus experience so that's kind of like a whole other a whole other thing and this is an area I'm really interested in and trying to challenge and and figure out a way forward because even in that sentence you know what's the um you know what's the impact or the complexities of of male and female and suicide prevention leads out a whole group of trans people from that data and that conversation um I don't know if it's useful but I think it's useful for me because I I talk with a lot of assumed knowledge but it's really just that um just to flag this conversation you know sex and gender are different they're not the same sex is your biological characteristic that's given to you at birth that's your identifier is you know f for female m for male um then there's gender identity these are the um the way we uh, explore and, and act out our gender in the world so some people are cis so their sex characteristic matches their gender identity they were assigned female at birth and they identify as as, as a female as a woman and there's people who are trans who are fit outside of that model so whatever that assigned that gender at birth was they don't mesh with that so that's that's the trans umbrella right and when we have those conversations all those people are left out um and the biggest complexity with this is not even just in the suicide prevention data it happens before that in that in the 2021 census, trans people weren't even included in our data about our population. I think is a very telling sign about, you know, the way uh, we are we are excluded from the data. So then it's hard to kind of come into research spaces um, and that are advocating for suicide prevention policies and strategies when we're not even part of the conversation. How can I advocate for a, a set of data that doesn't have me represented in it as someone who has lived experience of suicide and suicidality <laughs> so I just think that um yeah that's kind of I guess the, the the overarching map and the compl comp complexities of it of is that I do see how uh breaking into groups um is useful but 
I don't think they're the right groups. <laughs> and if, if they're useful but exclusionary, it, should we still use them? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting on the concept of grouping because a lot of um, the, the grouping gets done because the risk factors are different between men and women. Um, do you have any any thoughts about that and how we you know characterize men for example as uh not talking about their feelings um being you know got to tough it out kind of attitude mm. whereas women are more emotional like how does that then influence the the whole other diversity like you said that's missed out of this conversation yeah um it's a tricky one as well because like when we try and name those things, you know, for example, if we take the um, the masculine kind of characteristics, you know, of, of toughing it out, the stoicism, um, when we reflect on those in suicide prevention data and, and use those as groupings, I think we actually um, then kind of reiterate those as characteristics that exist and should exist and are like prevailing um, characteristics of that, of, of, of gender. Um, and so it's not to say that we shouldn't talk about them and name them as part of our social social constructs, but I think sometimes it has a double-edged sword of um, being reflective of um, of men to have those characteristics, but also um, uh, further kind of projecting that onto men. Um, so th I think those labels just aren't very useful. Um, not even just because they're actually not, they're made up in the first place. Um, and we don't really want data sets to be made up, I make up. Um, but also then they, again, they have the same the same problem of uh, existing, you know, if there's one that has to be another. So the binary stuff, I just find really unuseful when talking about um, people. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, I totally understand that and relate to that. Um, in my own lived experience, uh, my male partner, I, he doesn't fit all of the targeted suicide prevention messaging for the um, the men who um, don't talk about the feelings because he, he talks about his feelings like a lot. And um, so I, I see I see how that those kind of stereotypes then also perpetuate the the incorrect beliefs about the characteristics of the different the different genders mm. um this isn't really a topic that i know much about and so really happy to be learning from you in this mm. you said earlier that you don't you sometimes assume a, a lot of knowledge um to someone who knows absolutely nothing about gender diversity mm. and identities <clears throat> what would be the the most basic thing that you would tell them to kind of start to help build that that knowledge base um i think a lot of it is about thinking critically about what we have learned socially about gender um and really questioning is that true like it's you know there's a psychoeducation piece about gender sex and sexuality as those three things are separate and I'm happy to, to kind of talk about that as well but in terms of like what people like what you can practically do is is just be kind of open to the ideas even if you don't quite get them um it, it's just I think for a lot of people who, with, who are LGBTQIA plus and particularly those who identify as trans it's kind of overwhelming that people don't see the difference and see the social um and don't feel that social burn from having to be male having to be female um and what that kind of feels like for them um you know it's just a simple thing of like it's really it's it's a kind of insanity to me that you would have um, a child who is a girl and give her something pink because that's what girls like 
Like that's just absurd to me. And I, you know, I think there's a there's a, the argument there is is that that's quite reductive. But I think it's a, just a primary example of how quickly these things kind of take off and start. Like, why is that the way? It's just a questioning. Like, why is that the way? If we can question these things in the kind of at, right at the start <laughs> of how, like where they begin, which is as soon as we're kind of popped out of the womb, where these kind of gendered things. That's kind of weird to me. I just like I think that's the thing is like, isn't that weird to anyone else? Like that we pop out of the room and there's there's only there's two options, we're this or that, and then there's these kind of predetermined things that we have to kind of do and be. Um that's just insane to me. Um but yeah, is it useful to kind of do the gender sex sexuality thing? Like, is that is would that help shine light on why we need yeah. to maybe be a little bit more thoughtful in that. yeah yeah um it's also this is my understanding of it too so you know um I can only come from that but kind of mentioned that um you know people talk about oh, you, you're either a male or female you have to be one or the other um I agree with that at the sex at the sex level at the at the chromosome level <laughs> um you know of course there's intersex um as well in that but if we're just 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 to be um kind of give a crude overview most people will receive the f or the m female or male at, at birth no one's challenging that <laughs> as an idea as a, as 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 a as a, a scientific biological thing that's that's that however that's where it ends. <laughs> and then we move on to gender identity, which is the way we express um, ourselves and our gender um, within the world. And that is a very diverse and 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 thing. You, you could be, you can be cisgender, you can identify with that, with that characteristics of 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 maleness, but still play with gender as a construct. Um, and to play with gender means to be separate from the the constraints, the social constraints that we put on us, i.e., girls like pink. That's already playing with gender, right? Because those things are, those social things exist and we can't do anything about that, but we can challenge them. We don't have to accept them as reality. Also within gender is, you know, being trans and, um, you know, identifying as separate from that characteristic. And then people come, and that's where kind of pronouns come in as well. That's like where people reflect their gender identity better by maybe changing their pronouns. Um, and that's separate again from sexuality. And I think sometimes those things get conflated. Your sexuality is just who you like and who you're attracted to or not attracted to. Um, that's sexuality. But those three things make up the kind of LGBTQIA plus spectrum. And I think all those things need to be considered um, when we're kind of talking about the gender disparities and things like that. Um, yes. Um, just out of complete interest, mm. do you think um, that the sexual preference, sexual identity piece that you spoke about just now mm -hmm. needs a like to be separate separated from the gender identity piece. Cause from how you just described it, they seem like really different things to me. You know, one is who how you feel in your own body mm -hmm. and the other is who you like. Like they seem to be two separate things. Do do we need to be separating them out of the LGBTI QA plus acronym or do they fit together? Um, no, I think they fit together um, because um, it's much like gender identity, those other sexualities fit outside that norm. So yeah. they fit outside that 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 gender norm of like men liking women, women liking men, and that being it and that being the bow on the box. So they kind of they live together for sure but they don't always talk to each other in that you can be cisgender, right? You can be male, um, have that male on your biological chromosome situation going on and be gay, right? So you can bypass the gender identity box and jump over here to sexuality. So you can still exist in it. Um, the one that is really complicated and probably the most relevant, and that's why I'm trying to isolate it, is this gender identity box when we're talking about data and suicide prevention, because I make up that who you like is not really going to, it, it does definitely impact your experience of the world and, you know, your access and things like that. But when we're talking about representing people, it's the, often the, the, the gender identity stuff that gets left behind 
you know, which is why I mentioned the 2021 census. Um, um, this, which is not to say that it's not relevant to look at um, LGBTQIA plus people and their sexuality and how that impacts their suicidality. Like anecdotally and lived experience, I know that that impacts people's um, suicidality. That impact my suicidality being being gay for sure. Um, and we can talk, you know, talk to that as well. But what impacts my suicidality as well is not being represented at all in the data because I'm not a man, I'm not a woman. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So how does it then translate into like suicide prevention practice where a lot of services use the data to base their programs on and mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of tailored supports for men, not so much women, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then separate LGBTQIA plus programs. Mm -hmm. um, the, I don't know, how, how do you think that it impacts those services to not have that data yeah I mean we're just lucky that there are um you know organizations um you know like ACON and they've recently launched launched here which is their suicide prevention hub like we've got organizations who are doing the work and that's great but I what I'm what I'm speaking towards is the mental health organizations who aren't linked in or don't have that kind of advisory and are still trying to um formulate programs and processes that inevitably include trans and non-binary people. Um, so those kind of targeted organizations aside, the ones that I work in aren't targeted. Um, and so what we see, and you're right, we see a lot of the generalizations across um, um, programs um, based on, you know, those two subsets of gender. We see a lot of um, um, really clunky, awkward systems and processes um, around like dead names and pronouns that are just not set up to deal with or work with um, the gender diverse people. Um, and so there's like, I guess there's two things. There's like system change that needs to happen and needs to be supported in order to like do it. But then, yeah, there's also pre-existing data because it does leave out a whole group of people um, and it does in my opinion focus a lot on the social um, you know social beliefs um, and constructs to do with gender and we have things like you know um, I actually don't want to I'm not going to like admonish any programs because I do think that they're very very useful but yeah they don't capture all they don't capture the depth and breadth of people's experience um, so what does that feel like then as a person who um, has uh, identifies as gender diverse, mm. what does it feel like being in a mainstream service that kind of doesn't accommodate that? Um, I think that, mm, this is, a, yeah, LGBTQIA plus people are very good at finding each other. And so we often hover at the fringes of programs and kind of push the sides and make a little spaces for ourselves. I think the problem is that that's where we feel comfortable, but we shouldn't have to do that, right? Like we shouldn't have to have like those discussions between us about this is all, we're not going to do this form because it's like a not very gender. Uh, um, and it, that, that's what it feels like. It's a lot of time we're just kind of like making our own rules and kind of because we have to. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of times when I've been working with consumers and just a breath of, like, relief when I share that I'm non-binary um, or, or, or if I share that I'm in the LGBTQIA plus umbrella and a referral comes through, it makes the it makes a huge amount of difference. So I guess it's kind of, it's a, it's a tricky one because I think we have, there are actions that we're already taking to make people safe at a program level. Um, but I'm just really bothered by the, the kind of research and data stuff that's still, you know, in the current year, 2023, there's no conception of a gender identity that's beyond kind of male and female. Um, and I, um, I saw online this morning that New Zealand have put questions in their census this year about have they yeah um so you might not be waiting too much longer 
to mm. see that kind of change happen. Yeah. The, the question that comes up a lot in circles that I have discussions in is organisations say there's so much diversity out there, like which, which diversity should we pick? You know, which bo- box do we need to be ticking to make mm. up a completely diverse, um, you know, service? Um, when resources are stretched so thin, are there like, I don't know, what advice would you give organisations to make their services a bit more welcoming um, to diverse people? Um, yeah, I mean, there's two sides of that. There's the diversity box, like from a like um, recruitment perspective, right? And then there's the diversity box from a program perspective but the best way you can make people welcome is by I guess there's two things is by having that reflected in your workforce Um, or when you can't or you know it's not you know not possible for for whatever reason um, spending the time to 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 train and connect your staff to communities um, and and other knowledge bases that have that kind of rich understanding um, and connection to kind of the groups that you want to target or whatever. But for me, it's not good enough to kind of do that. I would prefer the first option, which is you're actively having conversations about what your workforce looks like, who 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 they are, and if they really are a you know representation of your the communities in which you live and serve. That's what, yeah, I think that that's the most obvious, but kind of, it's this thing as well. I mean, this is another conversation, right, about this like merit based recruitment system, which is really fucked up, actually, because what's that mean? Like, yeah, I think a, a kind of overhaul in the way that we look at and think about people <laughs> when we're delivering person-centered services in particular is like a big thing um, and I know we do it anyway I know that we say merit and then we're like wink wink nudge nudge um, which is problematic in itself but like just some more transparency about who and why we hire um, I think would be really useful they don't seem like things that are too hard to achieve no I don't think they are I think it's just um, power and privilege mm. is just it's really e- it's really easy to just do things the way that they have been people and especially like um I'm not making excuses I'm just this is the realities and um if we're going to do blue sky thinking it is also useful to be like here are some realities that a lot of mental health organizations are underfunded and under resourced so you know at the organizational level sure there's things that they can do but I think it goes a little bit beyond like the scope sometimes of what they can achieve with what they've got um which doesn't render them, um, you know, doesn't give them a jail, get out of jail free or card, free card. It's just a reality, um, you know. But a lot of the work you can do as well is like, if I started working in my organization um, and really kind of prolifically pushed for pronouns in the email signature and some kind of more robust gender diversity training. Um, that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to be safe at work and I wanted to feel included at work. Um, and they were receptive to that and whatever, but it's like, sometimes that's how it happens and how change happens. It's by getting the people in and then letting us blow shit up from the inside um, rather than trying to be like, Oh, how do we do it from up here? Um, I'm sure lots of people would disagree with that statement as well. Like I shouldn't, there's an argument that I shouldn't be the one to, create reform and change in my organization I should be doing my actual job um, which is valid too it's valid yeah but I think that just people with lived experience generally kind of have to do that because um, the the people who are in power people without lived experience oftentimes not always but oftentimes um, yeah really resist that change and so you have to be kind of an agitator and Mm push people to change I think that's kind of universal in the lived experience space Mm -hmm. yeah I have some conversations of like um you know because I am like that it's kind of met with like well you must like you must be a leader like that's where you want to go 
and then I have like all those people, lived experience people rally behind you. And then the people in power are like, please don't come here. <laughs> like this kind of fear response of like, um, leave us alone in our ivory tower, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's strange. The whole thing is strange. Yeah. Um, and I really like your um, point earlier about critical thinking and to think really deeply about, you know, your current practice and, and how things might be excluding people or including mm. people in an unfair way. I think it's also like something I kind of, I feel like I maybe didn't touch on that is useful is that I'm not, there's no argument here that LGBTQIA plus people are like, I mean, they are a vulnerable population. But they, they're because of my argument about male and female risk is that it's because of uh, social constructs um, and the way that we view it and the way that we raise and we don't critically think about gender that they there is a higher or lower female male risk is what I'm, is what I'm trying to argue. Um, it's not biological; it's social. You know, he- males and females aren't in, like females aren't inherently um, weaker or more fragile. That's not true, just in the same way that men aren't kind of more stoic. Um, it is the way that we are raised and raised differently that encourage those behaviours that and then informs our suicidality based on those behaviours. Um, yeah, and but- so the argument is that by by in- the inclusion of a more gender diverse uh, mindset and framework would actually help and inform all genders <laughs> Um, and all genders and their access to suicide prevention that is actually specific to them and their needs rather than these kind of vague categories of maleness and femaleness that I don't really think serve anyone. Yeah, and um, that piece that you said before on on language and, and labelling people as vulnerable, that's something that comes up a lot in chats that we have um, through critical. It's it's not that they yeah have a biological weakness or they're weaker people. If you if you look at it really, they have immense resilience and strength to cope with the as you said the systems and the society that mm-hmm. um, you know is kind of traumatic for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's really important. Um, I personally feel and and a lot of the people I chat to to reframe that that language and say yeah. They're, they're at higher risk, but these people aren't vulnerable. Mm. That's disadvantaged by the systems and and um, the services, the, the support that they get. Mm-hmm. That's what puts them at higher risk. Yeah, yeah. I think the more and and this this, this I'm happy for this to be challenged too because this could be um, definitely a priv- privilege coming through of my own. Um, but I think the more that we assign or ascribe a biological reasoning to kind of pain and suffering the further we get away from the actual issues which are in my experience at least and from people I've speak I've spoken to in the LGBTQI plus community it's a social um you know determinants that are really the factors to our wellness or lack of wellness um and 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 really it's just it's I think what at the core of this is that I would argue that that heteronormative framework that exists and prevails is just a disservice to all people. Um, yeah, even if you're even if you are um, a very happily cisgender and straight, you st- still kind of don't benefit from the categories of gender. <laughs> um, yeah that's something that comes up a lot when I talk to people um before we wrap up today is there anything that you kind of wanted to get out there that you haven't had the chance to say yet um I guess that that there are organizations and people doing really important work who are probably way more apt to kind of tell this story but this is just something that I felt compelled to talk about because um, and you know we had this discussion before is that um, I do find myself in situations where 
I'm getting side-eyed because someone knows that I'm gender diverse and we're talking about maleness and femaleness and it's just so uncomfortable to be in those situations. Um, and I just think it's worth keep having a conversation at this kind of grassroots critical level as well about, you know, I'm not the big, you know, full organisations who can make this change, but I think talking to it in this way is still useful. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we don't believe that there's any more or less voices in the space that can speak on topics like this. Um, the, there is diversity in lived experience and everyone, I think, is on an equal footing and, and all voices are valid in this space. Um, so don't feel like your voice is less than other people who are uh, much louder mm. out there doing this kind of work. Um, you've shared some really insightful things and helped to build my understanding of, of the diversity, the gender and sexual diversity picture. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed hearing your thoughts on this. Thank you. It's been great to talk about it. So there you have it. I hope you learned as much as I did from this discussion. If you've liked what you've you've watched or if you have something to say about it, please engage with us through commenting or check us out on our social media platforms. Get in touch with me and I'm happy to get your message out there. Uh, really hope to work with you in the future and take care.